Hi, I'm Ashley Smith, and welcome to this episode of Nature in the Hills. Today we're visiting Brenda's Butterfly Habitat, and with us today is Brenda Diesick to share some more information about the butterfly habitat here. Welcome to the show, Brenda. Thank you. Thanks. So the first question I wanted to ask you is how you got this wonderful butterfly habitat started and how you keep it going to such a success, how it is today. Well, I always wanted to have a butterfly house and I have been given Barson's greenhouse seeds for years. So when I give lectures all over and people want to know where to buy plants, I tell them to go to Barson's. Mm -hmm. So let's see, this is 2011. I asked the owner, I said, Joe, would you rent me space so I could build a butterfly house on your property? Right. And he says, Brenda, <laughs> you don't have to rent the space. We'll let you use it. Oh, that's great. So their son got rid of um, most of his backyard. They took down cyclone fences and they told me how much land they'd let me use. So I drove down to Ohio to um, Greyhawk, Butterf or Greyhawk Greenhouse Supply and said, okay, Barsons is letting me have this much land build me a, a um, butterfly house this big. <laughs> and um, I wanted to utilize as much space and build it as big as I could. So um, I started building this last, um, they put up my butterfly house, um, the greenhouse in February. And then I started laying newspaper on the ground to kill all the weeds and grass and, and um, put mulch everywhere. And then I started planting and I opened last year. Oh, wonderful. So, um, I think what makes it a success is this butterfly house isn't like most butterfly houses. Most of them that you go to, they import the chrysalises mm -hmm. from other countries, which is nice. You know, I've done research in Ecuador and the Amazon rainforest, and yeah, those species are beautiful, but I wanted to teach people what's in their own backyard. Right. So I wanted to have the host plants so I could have teach people the whole metamorphosis and show people how easy it is to have these butterflies in your yard simply just by planting the host plants. Right. So I think that's what makes this a success is because these are butterflies people can have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially since it's so uh, easy now for folks to grow natives, there's a lot more information out there. So to be able to have those plants and have those butterflies in their own yard is really special I think. Yes. So we were we've been here today we've seen some visitors here you know taking home caterpillars and watching the butterflies so what are some things that visitors can expect when they come to butterfly uh, the butterfly habitat and um, maybe what are some I guess some questions they might have or some things that they ask you when they come? Well what people can expect mm -hmm. um, I'm always wanting to show them the different eggs and caterpillars and chrysalises to show them what the whole life cycle looks like of the different species that I have it's going. It's great they can see it all here too. Yes. Just walking around to the different plants. And and I always am giving away some type of caterpillars mm -hmm. if they want to purchase the plants or they already have the plants at home. Um, so I'm giving those away. Uh, a lot of questions are well, how do, what plants do I plant for butterflies? And, you know, I have to tell them, well, it depends on what butterflies you want. And it's really important for the host plant. You can plant nectar plants. Right. And the butterfly will fly through your yard and take a drink, but it will be, go on its way to find a place where it can lay its eggs right. and the caterpillars can feed. So I'll tell them, just look at my host signs and see what butterflies you'd like in your yard and plant those plants. And once you have the host plants, Butterflies can smell from miles away and they'll come and lay eggs and you'll have those species in your yard. That's great. So if you plant them, they will come. Absolutely. <laughs> so we've seen a lot of butterflies flying around, seen the caterpillars, like you mentioned, the life cycle is all around us. So what are some of the species that you have here? And maybe a little, t just tell us a little bit about some of those special butterflies that you have. Well, I have 13 different species in here. Um, That's great. They're all in different stages. Mm -hmm. um, my eastern tiger swallowtails, um, they're either an egg or caterpillar right now. Um, they're some are up in the top of the trees, so I can't see if they've hatched or not. <laughs> um, my giant swallowtails are little teeny caterpillars. I have spice bush swallowtails, pipe vine swallowtails, black swallowtails. I have American ladies, red admirals, monarchs, common checkered skippers, hummingbird clear wings, which is a moth that's a diurnal. Right. right. Um, so mo a lot of your moths fly at night, but this one flies during the day. 
Um, I have Viceroy's, I have Red Spotted Purples, um, Morning Cloak, and I could be forgetting yeah, some. Yeah, that, well, that's a lot. Yeah. And it's a lot to remember, and I, but I think the one of the neatest things about that is you can find all of those butterflies and moths here in Michigan. Right. Which is really exciting, I think. And coming here and having you answer their questions about what what is this butterfly and what does the caterpillar look like and what does it eat, what's its host plant, I think is really great information for people to un understand about butterflies that they might not yeah. have known before. Yeah. So I guess with that being said, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have to maintain your butterfly habitat here and what, what are some of the most rewarding times that you have? Well, the most challenging, challenging <laughs> things are par predators and parasites. Right. Um, I have a lot of calcid wasps that will lay their eggs on the pre-chrysalis. Um, pre-chrysalis is like when the monarch's hanging in jay or the swallowtails yeah. are laying back in their little sling, getting ready to shed their skin. These calcium wasps, the females will stay right on the body of that caterpillar. Mm. Soon as it sheds its skin and their soft tissue, it will lay hundreds of eggs on that soft tissue before the chrysalis hardens. Mm. And so instead of getting butterflies, you'll get hundreds of these oh. calcid wasps. <laughs> then um, because I've got, you know, the netting on the top, um, different predators can get in or they'll fly and come in the door. I have grasshoppers and crickets and right. katydids that will eat my butterflies and caterpillars. So I'm all the time, and I'll have stink bugs that will suck the juice out of my caterpillars. So oh. you know, I've got a lot of predators. So that's my big problem in here that I try to protect as many as I can. Mm -hmm. um, the rewarding things are just seeing people's faces when they can take home these caterpillars. And then I have um, a big Facebook network, and they'll send pictures and. They'll send me emails or they'll post on Facebook. Oh, Brenda, today we released these butterflies. Oh, this came out. And it just really does makes something you, to makes my Makes you feel good. It, it yeah, does. it warms your heart. Yeah. I know that um, at the Nature Center, you know, we see all, all different families from Farmington Hills and the neighboring communities. And a lot of folks have visited your butterfly habitat. And so they're so excited to bring in their butterflies that they got from you and show us what stage they're in and maybe when they're close to releasing them. So. Um, I think that's really exciting. I can mm -hmm. see that on their faces too, that they had such a fun time here and they learned so much from their visit. So I think that's really great. And I think it's interesting too, how you, the, what you decided to say is the most challenging is protecting the butterflies. I think they're so lucky to have you here to protect them. <laughs> but I also think it's interesting that one of the things you didn't mention are na maintaining your native plants. A lot of people think that's so difficult and that would be such a challenge, oh. but you've made it look so easy and these plants look so healthy and beautiful. And I think that's great that it's, you can show how easy it is for people. Right, because mm -hmm. native plants really don't need any help from us. They've evolved here for over thousands and thousands of years. And so, you know, once you plant them and water them and get their roots established, you really don't have to do anything. Right, so um, we were talking a little bit about some of the plants that the butterflies use as host plants. Um, what are some more of the common plants that you have around here that are the native ones that you have in your butterfly habitat that people can grow in their own yards? Just some easy As well, ones to well, grow, one way, uh, right behind me here. For mm -hmm. the monarchs, and also when it has flowers, um, all sorts of species love to nectar on it, and your, your bees and everything, mm -hmm. so it's a really um, a plant that all your pollinators like. Uh, then there's other, see, I like false nettle, which not too many places have, but Barsons have it, mm -hmm. um, and then Trish, out at American, American Roots, Roots yeah. Trish has it. Um, but it's a host plant for four different species, wow. so it's not really showy, but if you plant the false nettle, you'll get the question mark, the Eastern Comma, Milbert's tortoise shell, and Red Admiral. Um, other things would be like your prairie willow. Mm -hmm. That prairie willow, anyone can plant in their yard because it doesn't um, go into the water table like a lot of your mm -hmm. willows do. And it only gets six feet tall. So it doesn't get, so, doesn't spread really right, right like and, a lot of the other willows. Mm -hmm. And it, so there you're getting a host for the red spot of purples, viceroys, morning cloaks, to say a few. Right. Um, you know, so a lot of, like ironweed, it's a beautiful nectar source, um, mm -hmm. and that's a native plant. Mm -hmm. Pearly everlasting for the American ladies, you know, um, 
there's just so many. And for the cute little spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, you know, spice bush, everybody should have a spice right. bush in their yard just so they can witness the cute just little caterpillars. Reason, right? Yeah. And I'm excited in a minute we're just going to go take a tour and see some of those plants and butterflies and caterpillars up close. Mm -hmm. So that'll be exciting to see what they look like in flower and different times of the year. Um, what are, I guess, um, some of the reasons why butterflies and pollinators are so important because some people see butterflies and insects and they think oh that they're, they're a pest they're eating my plants or they're in my garden why are they so important and why should people be working to attract them to their yards well not only are they pollinators which we need pollinators or we wouldn't have all the beautiful flowers and vegetables and everything mm -hmm. but also they're a piece of the puzzle of our ecosystem mm -hmm. and if you pull out the butterflies, you won't have the caterpillars, you won't have food for your grasshoppers, crickets, frogs, toads, our beautiful songbirds, mm -hmm. which even if they're a um, seed eater, when they have their babies, those babies can't eat seeds and most of their food is from caterpillars and worms and without them we'd lose m so many of our songbirds. But the list just goes on and on of the different predators, um, things that we don't like to see happen to them, <laughs> but it's really important. Right. And as long as 1% make it, our ecosystem will be in balance. But if you start eliminating these, we're going to pull out pieces of the puzzle and the whole system is going to collapse. So they're just so important. Right, they're definitely an important yes. part of how the biodiversity and how things work in the ecosystem. Absolutely. So this year there's been a lot of talk from scientists and even just citizens alike that they have not seen as many monarchs or just cat caterpillars and butterflies in general. Right. So have you, is that something that you've noticed too? Yes, and a lot has to do with last summer all over North America we had s such a hot, dry summer right. that it just wiped out a lot of the plants that they need. Mm -hmm. Then the spring, it, throughout North America, it was cold and moist, which kills a lot of our larvae. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're seeing fewer of most of our species this year than we normally do. Okay, I think that's interesting for people because a lot of folks don't realize that the summer before how the weather was and the climate is going to affect the outcome for the next year because yes. how they go through their life cycle and, and especially monarchs migration. Um, some people have mentioned pesticide use and habitat oh, loss is yep. also and affecting that. Both of those, yes. Okay, so is there anything that you, advice that you give folks or things that you think would help their, bring back the monarchs or you know help increase their population? Anything that you tell folks that are concerned? Well, I just tell them definitely plant milkweed and if you have a small yard and you can't plant the common milkweed you know plant swamp milkweed it doesn't right. have the underground stems mm -hmm. um, it doesn't spread as much as the common it, milkweed. it doesn't spread at all if you mm -hmm. pick off the seed pods right. um, so you know plant swamp milkweed plant butterfly weed you know plant their host plants and don't use pesticides in your yard right because butterflies and caterpillars are insects so the pesticides will kill them right and i know a lot of even using herbicides to get rid of the native plants on the large um, farm fields even in the southern states has really affected how oh the gmos right. in there the gmo mm -hmm. soybean and corn mm -hmm. <sighs> they kind of wipe out all those native plants and yes. they're going to plant their whatever, whatever it's corn the, or soybean yep. so that also affects them too and it has it's plants. wiped out so much of the milkweed mm -hmm. all over it's it's really playing havoc on them. Right, right. And one of the things uh, that I think is really a fun way to get involved and interesting too, and it helps the butterflies, are the monarch way stations. Um, mm -hmm. Someone told me that once that Michigan has some of the most monarch way stations in the country. So, um, can you tell us what a way station is and maybe how folks can get involved with that? Yes, and I actually have the first one in Michigan. <gasps> Very exciting. Um, I'm number forty-five in North America, but right. the number one, first one in Michigan. <laughs> Um, you started the trend. <laughs> <laughs> and all you have to do is simply plant so many um, different kinds of milkweed, um, maybe even just two, but just have several of the plants. And then you have to have nectar plants throughout the spring, summer, and fall. It's really important in the fall because when our monarchs are migrating, mm -hmm. they have to have a place to um, nectar and they actually gain weight on the way down to Mexico 
and they live off those fat reserves all winter. Wow. So it's very important to really have um, nectar sources later in the season. Right. And then you just get a hold of Monarch Watch, and it's monarchwatch.org. Okay. And they have all sorts of information on um, the requirements of the Monarch Way stations. And if you want to purchase a sign for your yard, you can do that. Um, but they're a nonprofit um, organization, mm -hmm. which I've been giving Monarch Caterpillars away for a donation, and I'm earning money to send to them as soon as I close. So far, I've earned over $1,100 this season to send to Monarch Watch, so I'm so excited yeah, about that. that's wonderful. Because even though they work out of the University of Kansas, mm -hmm. you know, d uh, Professor Chip Taylor, they everybody that works there donates their time. It's all nonprofit. Wow, so, that's great. Yep. Yeah, so that that's really going to, I think, help bring back, hopefully, the, the monarch population to Michigan. Maybe we'll see how the summers um, progress on through the year, see if we can increase that habitat mm -hmm. and increase their numbers. Um, but so I, I know we already mentioned how folks can plant native plants to bring monarchs in. Is there anything else, any other last tips that you would give folks to attract butterflies to their property? Mainly it's just... I just preach host plants, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, because anybody can plant annuals, plant some zinnias, which butterflies love, or pentas, or lantana. Um, one flower that would be a perennial would be purple coneflower. Oh, right. And all sorts of butterflies love that. And then in the fall, you get the American goldfinches that mm, love they the love seeds. That, yep. So, um, you know, plant nectar plants, but the most important are your host plants. Host plants. So Brenda, can you tell us a little bit more about how how your butterfly habitat is funded and if you're ever looking for volunteers? Well, this butterfly house is funded just through donations. I don't charge admission because I don't want to turn anyone away. I want right. to educate as many people as possible. So the donations that people um, give help me to be able to keep this going year after year. Mm -hmm. Um, so are the volunteers come here a lot and help out and do, are you looking for more volunteers to help you in the habitat? I'm always looking for volunteers. I have a very few people come to volunteer. It's um, hard to find volunteers. Yes, it, it <laughs> is. And anytime anyone ever wants to volunteer, if they just, they can send me a message on Facebook or send me a message through my website. I would be more than happy to um, let you know my hours that I'm going to be open and have you as a volunteer. Even if you just want to ask people to watch your step for caterpillars or butterflies on the walkway right. and to send a guest book, or I'll teach you as much as you want to know. And if you have any questions, you can always refer to my book. But volunteers would be awesome okay, because great. a lot of times there's so many people in here, right. it's impossible for me to speak to everybody at once. Right, right. That's great. So volunteers can check out your Facebook yes. page or they can even stop in and talk to you about what things you need. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any other places where folks can go to get more information about butterflies and host plants? I know they can come here and talk to you. You're, you're great with visitors giving them more information. Any other places that you would recommend that folks can go to get more info? Well, um, they can go to my my website, um, butterfliesinthegarden.com, right. or I have a Facebook page um, that I just talk about butterflies, moths, and host plants, mm -hmm. and that is Brenda's Butterfly Habitat. That's on Facebook. Okay. Um, also, if they want to purchase my book, I right. have detailed information. Actually, a lot of my species, each stage I show with a ruler that has 30 seconds of an inch, um, and my book is Learn About Butterflies in the Garden. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really great resource, I think. And those just those three things going to the Facebook page and seeing updates from caterpillars emerging and what butterflies you have at what time. So I think all those are great resources for yeah. folks. There's a lot of great things online too. Yeah. So I think um, I'm really excited to walk around and okay. kind of get a tour from you of what's what's in the garden right now and what's flowering and what butterflies are out. So you ready to go walk around? A little I'm bit? ready. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Butterfly habitat. 
So the first thing that visitors uh, will stop when they come in is at your sign-in table here, your check-in table, and they get to sign your guest book. And you've had people visiting from all over, right? Yes. Last week I had some people from Canada and they wanted some monarchs to take home for their grandkids. Last year I had a professor from A&M in Houston, Texas, and she came up here. Uh, she had told one of her students that she was going to stop at Brenda's Butterfly Habitat and he says, Oh, I just purchased her book. Oh, so she had her great. husband take a picture of me and her together so when she went back to school she could give it to her student. Oh, that's wonderful that you have so many visitors from all over. That's great. So, and then they kind of can walk down the path here and the first thing you tell them, I know, is watch your step. There could be caterpillars on the path, right? Yes, ca caterpillars are butterflies. Okay, so let's maybe move on to the first plant over here. Okay. Um, and I'll kind of, this is the swamp milkweed that I'm standing in yes. front of. And there's a small plant down here. It's Virginia snake root. It's host for the pipe vine swallowtail. And there's some eggs on here and a caterpillar still. Um, the eggs are very small. As you can see, they're kind of an orangish color. Oh, yeah. And this is the pipe vine swallowtail. <gasps> wow. And he looks like a gummy worm. Yeah. Well, actually, he doesn't look like a gummy worm. He feels like a gummy <laughs> <He does>. worm, <laughs> but he's very soft. Right. So he's wow. almost full grown. He'll make his chrysalis pretty soon, and he'll be a beautiful black butterfly if he's a male. He'll have iridescent uh, blue hind, hind wings, mm -hmm. and if he's a female, he'll be basically all black with a little few, few little uh, white spots. And yeah, it looks like they've been munching away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this plant here um, is on the endangered list in Michigan. Mm. However, people can also, I'm going to try to propagate some seeds this year. Okay. Actually, Bill up at Wild Type Nursery said that if I give him the seeds, he'll try to do it for me. Oh, wonderful. So um, I'm going to give him seeds. So hopefully we can sell this, or not me, I don't sell anything Barsons do. I give the plants to them. But hopefully they'll have these so people can purchase oh, them that's next year. Great. And then um, another host plant that they have is also, is a Dutchman's pipe, Aristolochia okay. macrophylia. Wow, so, so a lot of rare, rare plants. And then this is the swamp milkweed here, one of the yes. host plants for the monarch butterfly, right? Yes, and this is not invasive. This, um, I recommend people put this in their yard for the monarchs. Mm -hmm. And see monarch right there Yep, having a snack. <laughs> and it's interesting too, when you walk around the habitat, the, more, the closer you look at these plants and, and the, the faster you can spot the caterpillars kind of camouflaging themselves on the leaves. Yes, um, <laughs> there were oodles and oodles of caterpillars, but I've already given away about 7,000 of these, so I still have a few monarchs here and there. Oh, and when we, get a, when we come across a monarch caterpillar, I'll show you one, but I'm not okay, seeing great. one right now. Yeah, I know I saw a lot on some other of the swamp milkweeds yeah. too. So what is this beautiful uh, red flower here? This is pentas, and this is the an annual, and butterflies like to nectar on this, so I plant this every oh, year. Great. So it's for nectaring and not so much for a host plant. Then. Right. Okay, great. Yep. That's a good example of one then there. And here we see some monarchs mating. Oh, yeah. So they'll be laying eggs pretty soon, so I'll have a lot more caterpillars to give away shortly. Wonderful. So and what about this plant here that looks like it's been <laughs> munched on a lot? <laughs> yes, it has. Um, this is arrowwood viburnum. Mm -hmm. It's one of our native air, uh, viburnums. And the hummingbird clearwing, which is a moth that flies during the day, lay, lays its eggs on it and the caterpillars feed on it. If you had this in your yard, it would not look like this. <laughs> um, but I had thousands in here um, of caterpillars. Um, out in nature, you would really hardly even see any leaf foraging going on. Um, because there'd be right. birds and everything would eat them. Are you thinking about, do you, do you only have one of these in the habitat right now, or do you have, is this? I just have one, so okay. next year I'm not going to bring as many hummingbird okay. clear wings in here. I've, I'll have to get a better handle on uh, it, the amount I bring right. in here next year. <laughs> we have, we've had a lot at the at Heritage Park this year, too, I've noticed, so it must be a good a good year for them. Mm -hmm. So and this uh, orange flower up here and also oh, I don't want to skip um, the black swallowtail caterpillars here either because they are so beautiful yep. camouflaging there on that root. Right and here's one um, he started to lose his little saddle he's um, a younger instar oh, yeah. because when they're little they're um, basically almost like black with a little cream saddle but he's 
shed his skin a couple of times right. and eventually he'll look like those bigger yeah the mm -hmm. bigger ones on here that really bright so, green yeah. they're just so and beautiful this is rue mm -hmm. and the black swallowtails and the giant swallowtails both lay their eggs on it so it's a host for both of them okay and i know that um, they also will eat queen anne's lace sometimes in the garden dill parsley fennel a lot of folks will find the black swallowtail caterpillars on those plants but root this this is a really beautiful plant here. I know you said Golden Alexander is another Yeah, the Golden one. Alexander, that's mm -hmm. Michigan native. And, right. And they also lay on that. Right. And this is tropical milkweed. This is an annual. Oh, okay. Uh, wow. But a lot of people want to have it in their yard because it looks a lot like lantana. Mm -hmm. And this continually blossoms all summer long. Okay. So even though you have to plant it um, each year, it is a really pretty plant. Right. Wow, I, that's a really nice, really big plant for an annual. Mm -hmm. And then I around, we'll stop, maybe stop at some other places where you have some fruit, some watermelon. Is that something that folks can do in their own yard to oh, attract butterflies? Absolutely. Okay. I, you can use any kind of overripe fruit or um, butterflies. There's several different species that like fruit. Um, some of them would be the question mark, the Eastern comma, Viceroy, Morning Cloak, Red Spotted Purple, you know, those are a few of them that like um, the, the fruit. fruit. Mm -hmm. I use watermelon just because it stays moist right. the longest. Right, a lot of moisture, yep, yep. And oh, it's okay. cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this time of year especially, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So we have some more rue. And then is this for nectarine here too? Yes, this is for nectarine. Okay, great. And the plant behind it is false nettle. Oh. It's not showy, but this is host for four different species of uh, butterflies, eastern commas, question marks, red admirals, and Milbert's tortoise shell lay on um, nettles. This is false nettle, mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about getting stung, stung like with a stinging, stinging nettle nettles. or wood nettles. Yep. That's great, and it's kind of a lot of bang for your buck then. If you plant this, maybe you don't have the flowers, but I like how you have this in front, so you still get that beautiful nectarine showy flower, right. and then the, the host plant in the back mm -hmm. there. That's great. So here's some more of the swamp milkweed, and I noticed a lot of uh, monarch caterpillars on this as we walked around earlier. Um, let's see, maybe if we can spot one in here. I know there was, oh, this guy right there. Oh, okay. Munching on that leaf. Yep, yep. There are, there are a few still in here, so yep, this is one of the monarch caterpillars. Great. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was walking around with some other uh, folks, that visitors that you had, and we were kind of counting how many we could find on each of the plants. <laughs> yeah, most of these are gone now. Um, a few. Uh, well, here's a monarch oh, down yeah. here on the oh, butterfly weed. Oh, that's on the weed. butterfly weed. There. Yep. And that's so, pretty, a lot of that's done flowering. I know there's some still flowering in Heritage Park, but mm -hmm. that's a kind of an earlier milkweed there. That, and then I see the the pond here in the fountain. Now, do you recommend that? folks have some type of water source if they're trying to attract uh, butterflies, different pollinators? It isn't necessary. Um, it does help um, if you can have a little water source. Mm -hmm. They get minerals out of the damp. It could be damp mulch. It could be damp sand. I have pea gravel in there so they can obtain minerals out of there. Okay. And it's real, what it's real important for are males because when the male mates they deplete their system of the sodium and potassium and so before they can mate again they have to replenish mm -hmm. those minerals so um i have this water source in here if you don't have it it's it doesn't really matter because when it rains they're going to get moisture out of um damp soil mm -hmm. or mulch mm -hmm. but if you want to just extra little thing help them out help them out <laughs> you can you can do that you can use some rubber lining for a pond or you can buy one of those cheap like sterilite plastic boxes right oh say maybe four or five inches deep and put that in the ground then add some sand and a little mulch or dirt and if you want to spoil them you can add a little sea salt on there <laughs> um, or i saw earlier when we were here there was a question mark butterfly just kind of landed on your arm yeah, using you it, as a sodium source <laughs> yeah they like sodium <laughs> right so, yeah so over here i noticed the prairie willow that you had mentioned earlier mm -hmm. so what can what can you tell us about this who, who who is this a host plant for this is a host plant just a few of the things would be viceroy morning cloak and red spot of purple and this Prairie willow is native to Michigan. It only gets six feet tall and it doesn't require lots of water. Like mm -hmm. most of your willows will go right into your water table and mess things up. Mm -hmm. This one does not. So this is an ideal 
um, willow to have in your yard, especially if you have a small yard, but even if you have a large yard, it's a great choice. Great. Um, and then there's this really beautiful white flower. I've seen it a couple spots in, in the habitat here. So who is this a host uh, for? This is a host for the American lady. Okay. So this is one of the things that they lay their eggs on. And this is the pearly everlasting, right? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a really showy one. I think folks would enjoy having that in their yard too. Mm -hmm. And is this the false uh, nettle here again? Yes. Okay, yep. so again, I love how you did the showy in front. So, you know, you could have still have that one even though it's not a showy flowery plant. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, ironweed here, right? Yes, that's ironweed. And, and that's a great nectar source for all sorts of pollinators. So, um, you know, your bees and your butterflies and you know it's just a great nectar source i've seen it in rain gardens it's a wonderful michigan native plant it is yeah it's great yep. um okay so we have um the more swamp milkweed here and then is that your um spice bush there this is my spice bush and the spice bush swallowtail lays its eggs on it um i can show you a caterpillar one of the leaves fell off that one most of my guys are gone but this leaf fell off so i just kind of tried to oh. prop him up here um, Let's see on this, side. this, look at him. Yeah, so oh, wow. he looks like he has eyes, yeah. and those are just eye spots. A lot of your migrating birds have seen tree snakes that look like this, mm -hmm. so they'll just like, oh, we're not going to eat him. He's a tree snake. So right. that's his protection. Well, it's amazing how how many adaptations caterpillars and butterflies have to right. you know to d compete with those predators that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yep, he's green. When they're little, they're brown. And then when they get bigger, they're green. And then right before they make their chrysalis, they turn a bright yellow. That's great. So when and I see like them. the spice bush. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, this is one of their host plants, and the other one is sassafras. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to put him back up here. And then these over here, are these just nectarine plants? Yes, the, these are all nectarine plants. Okay, great. So we got the you know zinnias and marigolds mm -hmm. and the purple cone flowers. Mm -hmm. And then more uh, watermelon here yep. um, that, that attracts the, um, the moisture and the sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then the purple cone flower is the one that we mentioned how in the fall it also attracts the beautiful goldfinch too. So yes. you get the butterflies like the tiger swallowtails and um, but then also the beautiful yellow goldfinches in the in the fall. Okay. Let's see what's up. Oh, so then your um, rue over here got munched on too, didn't it? Yes, oh, it no. did. Yes, it did. And I, <laughs> they like I, that. Yeah, I noticed when I was walking by here earlier, and I should have moved him. There was, um, and I'm going to move him right now. This little guy, there's no food over here. Oh, okay. And this is what the black swallowtails look like um, when they're little. They're black oh, wow. with a little cream saddle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as they keep shedding their skin, they look different. So I'll put him over on the when parsley when we get past okay. there because there really is no food there for him to eat. Great. Okay, you want to keep walking down? I know I saw a lot of monarchs on this swamp milkweed here too. Mm hmm Yep, there's there's still a few more in here. Okay, so this beautiful purple flower here is one of my favorites. What's this flower? This is Rough Blazing Star. It's one of our native blazing stars, which is an awesome nectar source for our butterflies. Mm -hmm. I know we have a uh, marsh blazing star too. It looks a little different, but mm -hmm. similar flower. But yeah, that's a really nice one too. And that's a nectaring plant as well, right? Yes. Okay, great. Well, we've come to the end of uh, under the path here, and I just want to say thank you so much for having us over um, here at Brenda's Butterfly Habitat. And I hope you get a lot of visitors and more volunteers to help you out. Thank you. <laughs>
more information about Brenda's Butterfly Habitat, visit her Facebook page or her website online. Thank you for watching another episode of Nature in the Hills.